This is lecture two for lesson five. Let's talk about colors on maps. So colors on thematic maps should really correspond to the types of data you're trying to show. So do you have numerical data or do you have categorical data? Did you take a census and count up a bunch of things and come up with a rate? Or do you just have the overall preference for, let's say, uh, pizza toppings or something like that per county? And color schemes are designed then to include three major types that correspond to whether or not you have numerical or categorical data. You have sequential color schemes where you show less stuff to more stuff. You have diverging color schemes where you're showing stuff above and below an average. And then you have qualitative color schemes which use a different color to signify a different category. So let's say apples and oranges and pizza, currywurst, and tonkatsu. And I'll show you some examples now. So let's start with a bad example just so I can pound it into your head and make sure you don't do this ever and when you make a map. This is a sequential set of data here showing internet users per 100 people per country. So it's less of that to more of that per country. But I've applied a qualitative color scheme just to kind of throw you off here. A lot of people do this sort of stuff though as a general rule because they don't know any better. But why would you have purple being more than green, which is more than orange, which is more than yellow, and then more than red? You could kind of learn how to read this map, but in general it's very hard to pick out right away which places are high, right, and which places are low. Or what's the average? I, you can't do it very easily. You have to really study this to figure it out. Contrast that to the appropriate use of sequential colors here. This is sequential data, so let's look at sequential colors. This uses five different uh, variations in hue, lightness, and saturation to show less internet users per 100 people and then more at the high end. And you can see right away where the low places are versus where the high places are. It's pretty simple. You can do the same kind of thing using a diverging color scheme, which I think are quite useful. So what you do with diverging colors is kind of similar, but you pick a middle range and you say this is the average category. And then you make that maybe white or gray or something rather neutral because the average is not that interesting to you. But what you want to show here is two ends of the spectrum. So we've got green uh, scheme kind of going upward from the average so that you can see the high areas. And then a purple sort of, I don't know what you call it, mauve uh, color below average so you can look at low places. And I think diverging schemes like this are great for showing really, you know, what's above and below normal. And then this is the appropriate use of a qualitative color scheme. Let's say I had every country in the world vote on uh, one preferred pizza topping. So you had to ha have a contest and pick one for each country. In this case, you know, Australia, the United States, and Canada love them some sausage. And uh, Brazil's really excited about pineapple along with Saudi Arabia and Russia, which totally makes sense, right? So qualitative colors make sense here because a named hue that's, you know, red or purple or green or whatever it is, you know, corresponds to the fact that we have very different answers here that really aren't comparable or it's not less or more, right? Pineapple is not more or less than pepperoni. They're just different things. So in that case, when you have different things you're trying to show that are categorically different, qualitative colors make a lot of sense. Speaking of color, I want to talk about rainbows and why rainbows kill people. So rainbow color schemes, which are also called spectral color schemes, that's the right way to call them, are commonly misused on maps. Weather maps are some of the worst offenders where you sh show precipitation amounts from less to more by showing green going to orange, going to red, going to yellow, to purple, to white sometimes at the very top. It doesn't make any sense. It should just show less to more color because it's less to more rain, right? Almost every heat map you see floating around these days also uses these spectral color schemes. And they're bad for the reasons I've already mentioned. They use qualitative colors to show sequential or diverging data. So is blue more than yellow? Is purple more than blue? You might have a legend that tells you the answer to that question, but it's very hard for people to learn those things. And it's certainly difficult to pick out a visual pattern right away on a map if you've got that kind of thing going on. Furthermore, rainbows can actually kill people. And that's only a little bit hyperbolic on my part. A recent study uh, showed that doctors interpreting medical images of the heart that used spectral color schemes made worse decisions about the patient's outcomes than they did using simple sequential color schemes. So I think they actually can kill people. Here's an example of a poorly designed rainbow color scheme map, just so you never make them. Hopefully you'll never make them anyway. This shows uh, tweets about Mitt Romney and President Obama during the presidential election in 2012. And this is just a density map. Uh, these are geolocated tweets, so it should just show less to more of these tweets, right? Tweets about the same topic. And it looks really cool with this rainbow color scheme, right? It looks very lively and, and sort of engaging and and dynamic, right? It looks like you want to understand what's going on here. 
But take a closer look at it and try to make sense out of it for a second. Look closely at the color scale. There's orange sort of down toward the lowest end, and red is at the top end, and orange and red look similar to each other, but they're on opposite ends of the actual spectrum. And then, let's see, blue is more than green, which is, green is more than yellow, though. So how would you know for sure right away what was the low spots in the map and what were the sort of hot spots in the map? I, I mean, it, it looks very compelling at first, but it's actually almost impossible to interpret if you really try to go beyond you know, the presence or absence of data. Contrast that to this map, which just shows less to more purple. This is the appropriate way to deal with this kind of data. Here I'm showing density, so I just want to show less to more color of one color, and now I can see right away where I don't have as many of the tweets and where I have lots of tweets. So there you go. Rainbows kill people. Stop using them. Data classification is another aspect of thematic map design that's important to cover in the class. So assigning observations to categories is called data classification. And there are three major types that I want you to know about. There's equal interval classification, quantile classification, and natural break classification. And there's plenty of other methods beyond that, but it's sort of outside of the scope of the class to go into that in this, this sort of explanation. So the first method uh, shown here at the top right is equal interval classification. What you care about here is establishing an interval in terms of the value range. So if I have 50 observations along a set of values like I show here, I just decide that I want five classes, so I split it up into equal categories, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, and so on. That's the value range sort of driving the classification there. In contrast, quantiles, I want to make categories the same size in terms of the number of observations, not the value range. So I don't care what the observations sort of said about, you know, did the, a particular place get 22 on a certain score or whatever. I don't care about that. I just care about having, in this case, five categories of equal size in terms of the number of observations. So each category in this case has 10 observations. I count up to 10, and then I make a break, and then I make the next class, and so on. Finally, natural breaks in the bottom right corner. This method is driven by some fancy mathematics. So you let an algorithm decide where the so-called natural breaks in the data distribution are, and it actually works pretty well in practice. Uh, you don't need to understand the algorithm because it's just not germane to this class. Let's look at some map examples of each of these methods, though, so you can see how they work. In this case, I've got some fake data, because I love making fake data, um, showing the proportion of people that are admirers of beautiful Audi station wagons like I am. And this map, in particular, shows an equal interval classification. So what I care about here, if you look in the legend, is neatness in, in the sort of the value range for each category. So the first category is 0 to 20 people per 100, and so on, 21 to 40, etc. And if you look next to that little set of categories there in the legend, you can see I've actually printed here the number of states that are in each class. And if you pay attention to this in the subsequent maps, you'll see that it varies quite a bit depending on the kind of classification I use. So in this case, in the lowest category has only six states in it, whereas some of the higher categories uh, have over ten. Let's look at quantiles using the same exact data. So here, remember with quantiles, all I want to do is put the same number of observations in each class. So I count up the first 10 states, and then I put them in a class. And then I go for the next uh, 10 observations and put them in a class. And then the value range can vary, and there's not an equal interval between them. So the first category here is 0 to 30. The second one is 31 to 45, so it's much smaller than the first category, and so on. And you can see, though, that the number of states per class, which is what quantiles do, stays the same, right? So you end up with a nice visually balanced map when you do quantile classification. Finally, we've got natural breaks. And all of these differences are a little bit subtle, but you can tell different stories using these different classification methods. Natural breaks is using some math behind the scenes to try to figure out where the so-called natural sort of down points are uh, between clumps in the data. And you can see that the class breaks uh, vary quite a bit. So we have 0 to 14, 15 to 32 is the next one, um, 33 to 49, etc. And in the lowest class, there's only five members in that class. There's only five states in that low category. But in some of the higher categories, there's 12 or 13. So you can end up with very different visual balances on your maps, depending on the kind of classification you use. Finally, I feel like I'd be remiss without talking a little bit about text on maps. You're not going to do a lot of text design on the maps that you make in this class because of the tools we're using. But designing text on maps is a huge aspect of cartography. And frankly, there could be a whole class just on that. And just to give you a flavor for it, Think about choosing fonts and positioning labels to make a map work for your entire uh, city that you live in at multiple scales that would work on a mobile device, 
a regular computer and in a big printed sheet. It's really hard work and there's still a lot of manual effort that goes into placing labels and making sure those things are readable on a lot of the maps that you use every day. And one very simple thing that's kind of a fun little uh, thing to learn about text design on maps is this graphic shows here is positioning labels. And this is something that I, hopefully you can carry forward and use in other uh, things you might do. If you have a point here, like I've got this purple point, and you have to assign a label to it, and you want to position that label somewhere, the best spot to put it first is where position one is. And if that position doesn't work because there's a road crossing it or a city there or something else that blocks it, you can go to position two. And if that doesn't work, then you can try position three and four and five and six and so on. So this just gives you a way to prioritize label placement that's kind of quick and dirty and hopefully something you can take away from this class. So at this point, you've learned about the geospatial revolution, what spatial thinking and thinking like a geographer is all about, where spatial data comes from, uh, how spatial analysis works, and now a fair bit about how to design a good map. Hopefully this has been an engaging uh, enterprise for you to take this MOOC, and uh, hopefully what I've done in these lectures and the written content in the labs and stuff made sense, and you're able to take some of this uh, forward with you and make great maps to share with everybody else. Appreciate your time, and uh, I had a really fun time making this class.